Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you're doing all right today. I hope you're enjoying this sunny day. Uh, that's about it. The theme of today is rendering unto God. And sort of what does it mean? How do we live with God as a priority in the world? With that, we uh, start with our opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King.
The Old Testament meeting for this uh, 20th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, who, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze, and I cut through the bars of iron. I will give to you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord. And there is no other. I form light, create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. God. The epistle is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you, and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, <laughs> and you have become imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia in verse. <laughs> to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and do not take, do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Together we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 158. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we have on our bulletin cover whose likeness and inscription is this. And of course, we can actually see whose likeness and inscription it is, because if you read the letters on the, the right-hand side here, uh, it says Kaisar, and then over, coming around on the left-hand side, it says Vespasianos. So it is Vespasian who uh, came to power as Caesar in the so-called Year of the Four Emperors after the collapse of the Julio-Claudian dynasty in uh, AD 68 in June with the death of Nero, the Roman Empire descended into a period of almost anarchy. And there were four contenders that rose amidst all of this, and Vespasian happened to survive. Some of his own family members were killed as a result of the tumult, but nevertheless, the Flavian dynasty uh, kept Rome going for another 27 years, and finally, that then gave way to Nerva and his bunch all the way through Antoninus, Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. So essentially, uh, it's Vespasian that keeps Rome kind of on an even keel and leaves it to its greatest period during the second century. After that, you would have the uh, crisis of the third century, a series of dictators essentially assuming the uh, principate, and then finally you have towards the end, uh, after Decius and, and everybody, you've got uh, the uh, whole thing with Diocletian and the uh, Tetrarchy, and eventually that segues into Constantine the first, and then you have the, uh, the Christian period of the empire starting then, which in its own way was no less tumultuous, but for different reasons. Uh, so we have with this the understanding that in, even in the Roman Empire, you have this period of waxing and waning. Basically, there is nobody that seems to have the secret sauce when it comes to governing. The various families that are in power eventually lose power. Their members are assassinated, or there's a revolt, or et cetera, et cetera. And so you have even so-called good periods, uh, certain amounts of instability, and then you have a whole lot of instability as power passes from one dynasty to the next. And uh, it's this kind of really weak and, and wobbly government that Paul nevertheless tells the Christians, hey, it ain't so great, but God's using it to keep rioters like from not burning your house down. So the fact is there is a use for the government. And even 
those who are not Christians can be good governors if they want to be. Yahweh picks Cyrus, for example, the king of the Medes and Persians, to come in and conquer Babylonia, the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Back in Old Testament times, uh, after uh, Israel had been exiled to Babylon in 587 BC, you had this period of 70 years where they were essentially captives. But the Babylonians went from having a relatively competent ruler in Nebuchadnezzar to basically somebody who was too busy getting wasted and chilling with his harem uh, at, at his oasis resort in the middle of the desert, Nabonidus. And uh, it is in its decline period that you have the handwriting on the wall uh, in the book of Daniel, uh, where the Babylonians are found wanting, and Cyrus comes in and conquers the Babylonians. And here God makes a very interesting claim, is that he is the ruler of the cosmos. He runs the joint. And I guess there's something about being Christian is if you can't accept the fact that God runs the joint, you're kind of in the wrong building. There's a better place for you to be right now. So the fact is, one of the foundational elements to what we believe is in fact that the Lord is in charge. And it's not a matter of our belief in him. It's simply a fact. It is an established fact that the Lord is in charge. And we know this because Isaiah lived in Israel before. Israel was taken into exile by the Assyrian Empire, which preceded the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And Isaiah prophesied the whole matter with Cyrus. And of course, you have scholars, scholars. There's always some sort of scholar out there that has to say things. And the scholars say that, no, Isaiah was sort of after the fact. Well, only if you believe your presupposition. But there's a whole lot of good evidence to suggest that Scripture actually is what it says and says what it is. And it's trustworthy and true. These words are trustworthy and true. If you believe that Christ's words are true, you accept that Scripture's words are trustworthy and true, breathed out by the Holy Spirit for our benefit, that we may believe and have life in Christ what we just sang, right? These are words are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that we might have life in his name. So, when we see governments, number one, we're not riding the anarchy train, because that doesn't do anything except have a riot burn your house down, ultimately. At the same time, we don't exalt the government to this higher than human level. Giving unto Caesar is exactly what that is. We have to do things in this world to survive. We have to sign contracts. We have to pay bills. We have to wait on hold. It's not what we live for. I mean, you don't sort of, come tax time, be like, hey, I'm getting my taxes done. I feel fulfilled this year. Nobody says that. We do not live to pay our taxes. We do not live to sign our contracts. We do not live to pay the bills. We do them because they are a necessity. We do not do them because it somehow is fulfilling and an expression of our innermost being. So we have to remember what place rendering under Caesar is. Caesar, you know, this is a metal coin, this picture of Vespasian. You can't eat it. If you did, it would bung you up, and you'd have to go to the hospital. It will not nourish you. It might give you lead poisoning, for all we know, uh, depending, you know, how much gold and or silver might be in there as opposed to how much uh, base metal 
That, that was a problem in the third century, by the way. The Romans started debasing their currency. They also lost control of their borders. Their economy went south and uh, eventually led to the collapse of the Roman Empire. Lessons that countries since then sometimes have learned and sometimes have not. But uh, what they always say is that history does have a tendency to repeat itself. Nevertheless, uh, it's just a dead coin. So if Caesar wants your dead money, give him your dead coins. You have the living God, the one who can give you life, the one who can give you things you need. It's amazing when you have God supporting you how much you don't need, right? I mean, there's a lot of people in this world who are in love with their stuff. They're in love with their money. They're in love with their bling. They're in love with their electronic devices. They're in love with whatever favored possession they might have. And yet they can't have a little love for the Almighty that gives them that stuff. Right? There's something to be said about priorities. When you're rendering to God, that's the important thing. So what if Caesar wants your money? So what if you don't like the purposes for which Caesar wants your money? Just give him the money and get about doing God's work. That's what it's about. Now, where does this become a problem? Well, it becomes a problem when the government starts getting in on what scripture says and doesn't say, and starts telling you to do differently than what scripture says. Martin Luther wrote in his large catechism that we should go along with what the government says until that point in which it tells us to do contrary to scripture. And then we have to give our no. We have to say no. God will not let us do this. And if it comes to God or Caesar, God is in charge. God raised up Cyrus, and then when the Persians did not embrace the God that gave them the largest empire in the ancient world, God took that empire away from them, because a rather capable guy named Alexander the Great happened to come along, and he made mincemeat out of the Persians. So, the fact is that God gives nations power, and God takes it away. And that's all in the hands of the Lord. Now, as long as a nation is willing to let the church do its thing, even its blemishes can be forgiven. Our U.S. Constitution is not something that's heaven sent. Any document that can say that chattel slaves and Indians only count as three-fifths of a person is not from God. It's from the devil. But this document also permitted churches and the press to be free and to speak a voice that could inject morality into an otherwise secular government so that the many founding fathers who are not particularly in line with classic Christianity and whose Christianity consisted only of a vague morality. And we know this because the first Great Awakening was in the 1740s and 50s time era. The second Great Awakening was in 1803 and thereafter the Cane Ridge Revival. But between then, there was a big lull in terms of, shall we say, active Christianity. Most people went to church only as a pro forma thing and very occasionally because they sort of had to to look respectable. But otherwise, you know, Washington was not a regular churchgoer. Adams was a Unitarian. Uh, Jefferson rewrote the Bible to make it sort of fit his purposes. We don't have these real models of Christianity amongst some of our early presidents, and we shouldn't expect that. But nevertheless, God 
did bless their work, not because they were particularly good Christians, they weren't, Ben Franklin perhaps the least among them, but they, they allowed the church to have a free voice in society and speak the word of God and bless it. Where do you think abolition in this country came from? It came from churches speaking, saying that this nasty compromise whereby, okay, slavery is sort of bad, so we'll stop importing slaves in 1807, but we'll still keep it going. And people said, well, how can it be bad enough to stop in one sense and not bad enough to just stop it all together and try to do something? And, and you know, it shows you the sin that was in early America because, quite frankly, everybody kind of putzed around because they, they wanted the money and they didn't want to be decent and good to people, real human beings. They devalued human life. And as a result of them devaluing human life, they paid the price in the Civil War. And 600,000 people died that didn't otherwise have to. Why? Because people were greedy and people were evil. And the United States has to own up to that and fess up to that and realize that that's a part of our heritage too, for which we should be ashamed. But at the same time, the Lord allowed the voice of the church to carry the country through that tumult, and we were able to do things and help people in the world that nobody else was able to do. We rose above that fault, not because we were so good, but because God was allowed to do his good work in our midst. And that's the important thing. We see with Cyrus and we see with Caesar that when people are allowed to render to God, it also helps Caesar. When people are not allowed to render to God, Caesar crumbles into ruin. Now, of course, today we see that same sort of thing going on. There is a new wave of progressivism. Really, it's the same old wave. It emerged after the Civil War. In the 1870s, people wanted to shut down the voice of Christian schools in our country after the Civil War. Part of it because we had this wave of anti-Christian socialists that had come over from Europe and uh, wanted to mitigate uh, the youth from being taught Christian theology and principles because they wanted to make of society something else. And so we had the Wobblies, the International Workers of the World, and we had a number of other organizations uh, kind of pushing for socialism. And we can see from writings of people in the 19th and early 20th century how they were struggling. At the same time, of course, we had businesses taking advantage of workers and treating them cruelly. The Pinkerton uh, agency was often used to bust heads at union rallies and strikes and things like that. And that's not good either. The problem is, again, whether you're on the side of the socialist or whether you're on the side of the robber barons, nobody was respecting human life. Now what's really interesting is when you get to Roe versus Wade and its follow-on ruling, which nobody really talks about, Danforth versus Planned Parenthood of Missouri, What's really interesting about those rulings is they roll back the 13th Amendment without going through the proper constitutional process. And that's why they're bad law. What they do is they say that the unborn do not have rights, even though the 13th Amendment is written very expansively to give all Americans equal rights. And it doesn't limit whether you're born or not. So you had a bunch of judges deciding to make law instead of interpreting law by creating a Supreme Court ruling in Roe v. Wade where certain rights were peeled away, certain rights were taken away that the Constitution gave. And as a, a follow-on, for example, in the Obergefell ruling with regard to homosexual marriage, they declared a homosexual marriage is a fundamental right. Well, if that's a fundamental right, and the Bible says marriage is between man and woman, 
what's got to give. Now, if we look at recent actions of big tech squelching true stories about investigations of illegality and yet promoting false stories promulgated by powerful people, you know, the, the, the whole Russia hoax, you know, we, we find out now that it was a collusion between the Clinton campaign and the Russians instead of what they were trying to say. And, uh, you know, and we realize that we are in a society now where we have actors who are willing to bend the truth, to threaten anybody who tries to tell the truth, and to take away the life and or freedom of those people that they don't like. I mean, how do we know that they're not going to extend Roe v. Wade's removal of rights to, I don't know, the elderly in nursing homes? Or perhaps Christians? Where is it going to stop? Where is the thing that says, thus far and no further? We don't have it. They just haven't tried it yet. Now, of course, this altar doesn't have a political sniff test. Nobody's going to ask you what you do or who you vote for uh, in terms of politics when you come to the Lord's Supper. That's not a part of church. That's a part of Caesar's world. This is God's world. But what we do here is we look at Scripture and says, what does Scripture expect you to do? Well, it expects you to love God and love neighbor. If the civil world is doing things that do not love God and do not love your neighbor, we have to ask ourselves the moral questions as Christians. Should we support that or should we say no? Because when we stand before our Lord and Maker on the last day, he's going to ask us, did you support those who loved God and neighbor? Did you further my kingdom? Or did you act against it? And we'll have to fess up and give our answer. So that's the call of these scriptures in our lives as we live. We have to render to Caesar. There's no way around it. But we also have to render to God. We can't forget God when we render to Caesar. We can't forget God when we live our lives. We can't forget that our eternal citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship here is just temporary because we are going to pass beyond this mortal coil. We're going to fly to break the bonds of this surly earth and one day touch the face of God. So as we consider that priority in our lives, as we consider what it means to touch the face of God, we make our decisions in like manner. We consider rendering to God. We consider what can we do to love God and love our neighbor? What can we do to support those who love God and love neighbor? We, we make decisions. Some of our decisions might be okay and some not. We still, nevertheless, have to look very clearly at what's going on in this world to separate the truth from the falsehood. And we have to ask ourselves, what will happen to our churches if we support those who have already said they are dead set on getting rid of Christianity? When, when the education machinery has people who say, oh, if I could go back in time, I'd assassinate Christ, you know? Or we have people in the media and social networking and, and uh, others and Hollywood. Do you think they like Christianity? If you don't support the church, nobody else will. If you're not Christian, nobody can be Christian for you. So when we consider that, that's what we look at in terms of our decision making. How you make that decision is between you and God, and that's where it's going to stay. But remember, a decision that's made between you and God is a decision that each one of us will have to answer for when we stand before that same God. Let's bear that in mind. But nevertheless, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for each and every one of us. And even if we make right or wrong decisions, if our decisions are confused, if 
they are led in error, whatever the case may be. Nevertheless, we can still approach the cross. Because just as this altar does not have a political sniff test, neither does the cross of Christ. He will forgive you regardless of your affiliation. He will forgive you regardless of what you've done because he loves you. He died for you. He gave his blood for you. He rose again for you. And where we stumble, he picks us up. So, take heart. Whatever happens, whatever happens, if the secularists take over this country, it is because God is permitting it. And if anything, that will give us an opportunity to witness to Christ all the louder and all the more. And should they try to silence us, we will shout to the rooftops. And we will give our testimony. And if we have to do like the ancient church did and bow our necks to the swords and go to the lines, so shall it be. We will have been given the glory to suffer for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, while it is still day and while we have the chance to let our voices be heard, let them be heard. Even so, our citizenship is in heaven. All of this will go away one day. All this will be gone. The earth will be done. We will have a new heaven and a new earth to look forward to. And in, in that place, there will be no governments that crumble whether it's the Julio-Claudian dynasty, whether it's the Flavian dynasty, whether it's that of Nerva through uh, Antonius Pius and Marcus Aurelius, whether it's the Constantinian family, whether it's the royal families of Europe, whether it's the government of these United States, regardless of whatever failing sinful governments we've had over time, they will all be done. We'll finally have a government that is everlasting, and it will be personally, by our Lord and our Savior. That is a government truly worth looking forward to, and it is that citizenship in which we have our undying hope. And that's the true foundation of our rendering to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. And we remember all of those who are grieving. And uh, especially we, we hold up in your, uh, before your throne all those who have lost loved ones recently. And we ask that you give them your peace and the hope of the resurrection of all flesh. For those who have fallen asleep and you have not lost their hope, nor have they lost their citizenship in heaven. And we ask you to help those who are missing their loved ones to appreciate that and to look forward to being reunited. Lord, in your mercy. We ask you to be mindful and uh, help all those who are in some kind of pain or distress or dealing with some sort of illness, whether it is of the body or of the spirit. We ask that you comfort those who are uh, in need and uh, that you, you protect those who are vulnerable and we ask you to uh, give aid especially to those people dealing with some kind of chronic pain and uh, Lord if it be your will help them recover and have a greater degree of health and uh, be, be their relief and if, if nothing else, Lord, send them your Holy Spirit to help them bear the cross that they have. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We ask that you give your divine guidance and protection to all who are in need, especially we remember our military and their spouses. We remember our first responders. We remember the families of those who are in harm's way, who have to deal with a lot of stress, especially these times. We ask you to be with those who are serving us by caring for those with COVID. And uh, we ask that you bless our nation 
Uh, because if nothing else, we need your divine guidance protection now more than ever um, at this, this crossroads in our history. And we ask that you guide us to help love you and to love our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, our prayers. Eternal Lord, ruler of all, graciously regard those who have been set in positions of authority among us that, guided by your spirit, they may be high in purpose, wise in counsel, firm in good resolution and unwavering in duty, that under them we may be governed quietly and peaceably. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we commend to you your care those who suffer want and anxiety from lack of work. Grant that the wealth and resources of this rich land be profitably used, that all persons may find suitable and fulfilling employment and receive just payment for their labor. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, give us grace to trust you during this time of illness and distress. In mercy, put an end to the epidemic that afflicts us. Grant relief to those who suffer and comfort all that mourn. Sustain all medical personnel in their labors and cause your people ever to serve you in righteousness and holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For these and all other prayers, Lord, we set before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament on page 160. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Lord 
Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is given for you, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. the post-communion canticle, Thank the Lord, on page 